So before we jump into this week's episode, I just have to ask you a question. How valuable would it be to have direct access to some of my past guests to learn exactly how they executed certain strategies to grow their business? And I believe it would be extremely helpful to your entrepreneurial journey. And as someone who has had access to these founders, I can tell you firsthand, guys, it's super helpful. And I want to make it available to you. In fact, that is the experience and knowledge sharing that's delivered to each person every quarter when they become a Grindology member. Now, Grindology is an entrepreneurial subscription box, and it ships every quarter full of resources to help fuel your grind and your hustle. So what's included in the Grindology shipment? Well, first and foremost, every single Grindology shipment will include a copy of the Grindology Tactical Manual. Every single issue of Grindology will be chock full of real tactics from real business builders, not journalists. And within the pages of the Grindology Tactical tactical manual, they will be delivering to you the tactics and strategies that you can integrate into your business immediately. How great would it be to receive real Facebook ad strategies from those who are doing it successfully? It would be super helpful. And those are the types of tactics that will be found in each issue of Grindology. And like I said, it's real tactics from real business builders. And in addition to the Grindology tactical manual, each shipment delivers two bags of uniquely crafted coffee, specifically roasted for you, the founder, the hustler, the entrepreneur, the maker and creator. Each shipment also includes an exclusive mug that speaks to your unique nature that is you, the entrepreneur. Everything about Grindology is about helping to fuel your grind. And in fact, that is exactly why our friends at Design Pickle have partnered with us for our first box. Yep, the homies at Design Pickle are hooking up one lucky subscriber with a full year of unlimited graphic design services. Guys, that is a $12,000 prize. Like I said earlier, everything that we do is to help you with your entrepreneurial journey. So make sure that you visit grindology.com to learn more. Our Q1 box and the chance to win the Design Pickle package valued at close to $12,000 is an exclusive shipment. So make sure that you secure your box today at grindology.com. I'll make sure to include a link to grindology.com in the show notes and within the description of this episode. Guys, I don't know if I've ever been more excited to tell you about a sponsor. It's called Children's Business Fair. And let me ask you a question. Is the classroom the best way to teach your kids about money and business? Well, of course it's not. And real learning comes from doing. Welcome to Children's Business Fair. It's a one-day event where young people can launch and showcase a business. You'll be amazed by what children can accomplish, and it's really a great way to bring your neighborhood to life. Launching a Children's Business Fair is super easy, and it's free. And guess what? They'll even throw in $500 of prize money. Just go find out more at podcast.childrensbusinessfair.org to get a children's business fair in your area today. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Financially Free Journey podcast, and I am your host, Courtney Dyer. Today, I have a very special guest. I love these guest episodes, by the way. These have been so inspiring, and today... We actually have the benefit of hearing from Ken Green. And Ken, he has such an interesting background. He's coined the engineer of finance, and he actually started his career as an engineer. But in 2008, after the crash and the recession, he then pivoted his career into the insurance and financial industry. And he really realized that he was one of the few financial professionals that he worked with that really cared about educating clients and not just selling to them. And from there, founded and created his own unique approach to really help uh, people realize how to achieve financial freedom, which is fantastic, fits in perfectly to our show. And his focus is to help people grow wealth without using high-risk ventures. He also has a podcast, which is called The Engineer of Finance. So if you haven't heard of it, go look it up. He has some really great episodes and amazing topics that he covers. And he also has a website. It's called greenfi.com. 
Bradley.com. I'll go ahead and include that. I'll link it in the show notes for you guys. And he's been featured in things like Forbes, MSN Money, and Vox, which is just fantastic. So he's acclaimed, he's been awarded, and really his approach is really not having to use traditional banking uh, and products that people think of to be able to build your wealth for retirement. So without further ado, let's welcome Ken. Ken, welcome to the program. Well, welcome. Welcome, Ken. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, thanks for coming on. I'm, it's so great to have a fellow podcast host come onto the show and we can nerd out together about finances and all things money. I was just talking to Ken uh, before we started recording and telling him I was just listening to his podcast that I had just mentioned to you guys. And I love the topics he was talking about healthcare and he made it interesting guys. So if that tells you anything, he is a great host. So definitely go check it out. Uh, when you have a chance after listening to this episode, go subscribe. So, okay, Ken, I just told the listeners about your background. You, you started out in engineering and then did like a complete 180 switch to, uh, going into finance. And so, I, I am a little interested to dig in deeper. Why finance from engineering? What made you make that switch? Well, I had to. I was uh, all land development stopped. You know, I'm electric, I have an electrical engineering degree, civil engineering degree, minored in mechanical, and uh, got my PE licenses. Loved development, loved education. I was getting loved what I did. I was I, I was getting paid to do what I loved. That's always and good. All, and then it all stopped. Public works projects, land development, and then I'm on the corner saying I'll engineer for food. It's really fun. My family's out here. My now wife, but it was a serious relationship back then. Uh, we were dating. I just love the Reno Tahoe area. I didn't want to leave. And I'm like, what can I do to survive? So the first time in my life, I actually took a job or actually started a career for the money to survive. And that's how I got in the insurance and financial industry. And I was always fascinated by finances and the stock market. I always felt like there's a different way to play the game than what was being pushed. Uh, but that's how I got into it. And I hated it. And actually, to this day, I still struggle and hate the financial insurance industry, but I love my clients. And I'm just naturally contrarian, and I found that I'm really good at it. I really love the relationships I have with the people I serve, and and it's just fun playing the game differently, doing it differently. Absolutely. And I always say, don't get a job for the money, but it was to survive, and it's amazing what you're willing to do to survive. It's uh, true. Uh, industry. Well, it started out for the moolah, right? To get that paycheck, but then it turned it into a passion. A <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I couldn't depend on it. Uh, no, but then, mission, right? And, and ab absolutely. Stuff, well, yeah. and that's what tells you if your clients are happy, then you're getting paid. So really, right. your focus and your sole purpose is to really help your clients meet their financial needs. And so your advice is critical to them because you're not going to get paid if you don't help them achieve their goals, which I think is fantastic. So, okay. How do you think your engineering background helped you with that switch into the financial industry? I love details. I love designing. I love troubleshooting. And I, there's too many people in the financial insurance industry. They're just very, very, the ones that have succeeded, very hardworking. I've watched it. I've been in this industry since, industry since the end of 2008. The ones that are successful, very hardworking, typically very charismatic, brilliant salespeople, and don't bore them with the details. And so here you have someone like me who naturally likes to be in the corner. I had to learn their skill set, and boy, has this industry made me grow. I mean, I've learned to work with people. I've learned to be a better human being because of it, because you get told no a lot. Absolutely. Then, told, you know, back then, if someone talked down to me, not so good for me, I didn't like it. Now it's like, you know what, it's just, I'm indifferent. And, uh, but where it's really come in, I think is very valuable for me and my family and my clients I represent is I really like the details. I love troubleshooting and I love creating the perfect financial strategy <laughs> for what resonates for my clients. And, and there's a lot of different personalities and working within what's ideal. I'm very education focused too. I really like the education. I really like, I like my listeners, I like my clients to own the answer. And I think the more and more you empower them and teach them the details, show them how the game's played. Uh, that's, I think that's my skill set. And also too, the financial industry hates engineers hates accountants and CPAs. We ask way too many questions. A lot of questions. 
uh, a lot of uh, financial advisors I meet here, and there's a lot of good advisors out there. I always just joke, it's the 99% that make the 1% look bad. And, uh, but there's a lot of good people in the industry. And, uh, but they're fascinating. It's like, my gosh, the majority of your clients are engineers. I, I hate dealing with engineers. So that's perfect. Like, I love them. Send them my way. And yeah, it's very typical. I, I like attracts like. And when I first got in the industry, I literally had engineers coming to my office, just fascinated that I was an engineer uh, helping people with insurance and, and finance, finances. Like it was fascinating to us. Like, why would you leave engineering to do this? And, uh, but it was a, it, me who's, especially back then, I was a marketing idiot. Uh, but just naturally wanting to treat everyone like I want to be treated and I can be pretty high maintenance, answering everyone's questions, empowering them and troubleshooting and going into the details. Um, naturally I was, that's who was coming to see me and, uh, you're accountable. You say what you're going to, you do what you say you're going to do. And it's just amazing how that right there distinguish you, distinguishes you from a lot of the competition. Well, you brought up a really good point that I want to touch on a little further. You mentioned that you like to focus on educating your clients. And something that I've heard from lots of listeners, I've probably received over a hundred emails with this specific antidote or question is, I want to better myself with my finances, but I am really intimidated when I go and I talk to a financial advisor or someone who is a professional in the industry because a lot of the information that they're just throwing at me, like regurgitating at me, I don't understand. I don't understand what they're talking about. And then I feel stupid to ask questions and let them like, I don't know what, what you mean when you say diversification. I, and so a lot of people get stuck not progressing because they feel intimidated and scared to ask those questions to clarify what they need, need to do to be successful. And so the fact that you love educating your clients is something that I would say for the listeners, they need to really dig into and they're meeting with a financial professional because you need to make sure that your advisor or your coach, whoever you're meeting with, that they are willing to sit down, answer the questions that you may deem as dumb, but no question is dumb, right? I mean, that's how people grow. I would argue that I think a lot of advisors just use fancy terms to actually intimidate their prospective client or potential new client. And, and I think it, in many ways, it's meant to be intimidating. And uh, so, and I understand that finance is a big deal. It's, it's your, we work so hard to, to build up the money and now we're going to trust that over. And also, it's also intimidating, is especially the process that I put uh, clients through is they, you're getting cut open like a fish. I mean, it's not, I mean, some really wealthy clients don't want you to know how wealthy they are, right? They don't want the neighbor to know. And, uh, but then also others are embarrassed because they've made mistakes and they don't want to r reveal that. And quite often the way I just take that away is that here I was a electrical engineer, licensed civil engineer, professional engineer, licensed in Nevada and California, which pretty much when you have California, you have re reciprocity across all the, the states. And it's like, Hey, I thought I was so smart with money. I lost it all. Right. That's how I got in the industry. I just got my butt handed to me. I thought I was so smart with money. And uh, I had it all wrong and I didn't have the mentorship or the right financial advisors in place. I mean, I had a financial advisor, but what a joke uh, because they were just looking at one myopic thing. They have their bias. They had something to sell, which is solely the stock market. Didn't understand my current financial position. Didn't understand my income streams, my liabilities, things that resonated for me. They just said, Hey, put X amount into the stock market. And when you, you, you know, it's like, my gosh, you want me at 22, you want me to put all this money in? And, and I'm going to wait till I'm 60. That's, that's outrageous. I'm going to be dead before I hit right. 40. It's like, oh, trust me, can't just go do it. And I, <laughs> and I did, right? Because he's a financial advisor. He must know so much. Um, and so I think what happens, what I like to do is, sure, I want to dump eight years of my brain into my first meeting. That used to be a real problem. You know, years ago, I'm having three, four hour meetings with clients and that just is it's overwhelming. Absolutely. Um, uh, but I don't have any type of bias. I just want to see what resonates for people. And I think majority of us who are sane, that we all, a lot of us will come in with a certain set of facts, but we don't know all the other facts, right? And so there's assumptions, there's opinions, but I have found that most, uh, you know, if we're sane, most people, when you, you go from three facts to about 40, 50 other facts, majority of us are going to come to the same conclusion. And I think that creates a strong foundation and it creates empowerment. I love lifelong relationships. Uh, however, I want my clients empowered. I want them, if heaven forbid something happens to me, 
they know how to look at a boring auto insurance contract. I mean, I don't sell auto insurance, but I sure advise on it. They know how to look at a boring home insurance contract. They understand how uh, to walk through things so that they're empowered. And then, then it becomes more of me like a mentorship role. And it's just, it's great when clients call, listens, call, say, hey, I was thinking about this, this, and this, based on what they've learned. And then I just want to shop the idea. And it's like, yeah, I, let's go do it. So, uh, so I think that education is impo- uh, important. And also, I think it does take away the intimidation factor. And also, I would argue that um, a test is easy once you know the answers. And I didn't write the answers. And I just take that away. It was like, hey, you couldn't have screwed up any more than me. And just because you're really sharp in one area, that doesn't necessarily carry, or carry over to another one. And so I learned a very painful lesson. I learned the hard way. And it's also something that makes me very passionate is that I crave to be the advisor that never existed for me when I was 22. And so anyone who walks through my door, whether in person or virtually, I represent clients East Coast or West Coast. When anyone calls about a comment on the show, I just love helping them go take that next step, point them in the right direction and, uh, and not have any type of agenda, but just an agenda to serve them like I wish I was served and, and, not, and have them learn vicariously through all my mistakes because, boy, I know a whole bunch of ways of, not, of how not to do things, uh, but then show them the right way to play the game and create a lot more financial certainty, create that empowerment. And, and also it keeps me sharp. Right. You, you get I got a lot of smart listeners, a lot of smart clients, and it keeps me constantly waking up wanting to improve and improve because uh, I'm a competitive person. I want them to know more about money than me. But, you know, it keeps me sharp and I want to keep craving knowledge. So anyway, hopefully that's my long winded answer. But hopefully that answer. I like it. Do you know an extraordinary child, a budding superstar who is ready to take on the world and who loves to have fun? If so, he or she deserves a chance to shine at a children's business fair, a one day event where young people can launch and showcase a business. Now, you'll be amazed by what children can accomplish. And it's such a great way to bring neighbors together amid sunshine and laughter. Now, at a children's business fair, children will make something with their own hands, they'll sell it safely, of course, to a stranger, and experience the freedom and responsibility of having a little extra spending money as a reward. It takes less than 10 minutes to apply and as little as three hours to plan a fair. Just set up a few tables on a lawn and send a few emails to friends and family. You can host a fair for free and we'll even chip in $500 as prize money. Sounds too simple? Well, join parents who want to equip and inspire their children to shine in the real world. Start your audition to host a children's business fair in your community or find out more at podcast.childrensbusinessfair.org. Well, no, and you know, it made me think while you were talking too, because you, you have the background of being a, uh, an engineer and it seems like you're really passionate around educating people, not being intimidating. And that's something for the listeners to take away is when you're interviewing your financial professional to help you. And that's what it is. You are interviewing them because they are helping you with one of the most important facets of your life, because the importance that it carries is it enables you to be able to chase dreams, passions, to meet long-term, short-term goals. Money is not the end-all be-all, but it's a tool to help you achieve the things that do drive true happiness in your life. So this person has a very important role that they're playing in your life. And so I want the listeners to take away from what you just said the genuine passion that you have around helping them holistically, not just around the products that you get paid commission on is a huge part of the listeners being able to identify that in a potential person to help them. Um, That's number one. Number two, another question that I had is what, what was your relationship with money growing up? How did your parents talk about it with you? I mean, before you got into the the industry, how do you think about it? What was your relationship? Oh, uh, I would say I was very fortunate. I mean, I grew up in Morristown, New Jersey uh, during the school years and in the summer in Annapolis, Maryland. And uh, so I would say my parents were, were great mentors, right? I mean, I, I think my, my mom, accountant, CPA, a real strong accounting background. My father, uh, you know, electrical engineer and a nuclear engineer. I've had him on my show, which was fun. It's like, gosh, man, he sounds so smart. And I sound like an idiot when I'm interviewing him. Right? That's a dynamic duo right there. Yeah, it's kind of fun. And so I had the, the nuclear engineer on, on my show uh, when I first started uh, doing the podcast. And, uh, but I would say just watching, I love, I guess, uh, 
I think this probably a lot came from is I just watch people through their actions, right? You can see what people say, but then you see through their actions. And I, I think I got great mentorship as a kid, just my mom, very conservative, can't have enough money under a mattress. And then you have my dad who had a great job as a nuclear engineer. I mean, he worked at, uh, you know, from the military, he was, a, he also went to a Virginia Tech and a phenomenal education, worked at Three Mile Island before it had its little mini meltdown and, um, and Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And then he left all of that, which is a guaranteed income stream as a nuclear engineer to uh, start the first computer land franchise in uh, Morristown, New Jersey. So, oh, wow. I, yeah, late 70s, all my my granddad, the neighbors, everyone thought he was crazy. It's like, you actually think businesses are going to buy a computer? And I actually have- He's lost his mind. <laughs> you know, I think every, every individual is going to have a computer. And so I think that combination of, and watching how they worked in synergy. I mean, my dad didn't pull the trigger, leaving that guaranteed income stream to start his companies uh, without my mom's uh, blessing and background. And it was a great area. My dad, very entrepreneurial. My mom, very good on the back end and bookkeeping and and uh, so I think that was my background, you know, uh, you know, my dad grew up pretty poor in Cleveland, Ohio, and, but he was very ambitious, got a phenomenal education and just went after it. And my mom growing up like in the Virginia, Maryland area, a uh, great background in accounting. So I think those two pieces, I really learned a lot um, watching through their actions. However, I did ignore my mom's advice about the savings component. That's what got me a lot of trouble. You know, there's a lot of power of making 0% interest, right? There's a lot of, right. uh, that's what got me into this industry is that I had very aggressive investments, uh, really pedals to the metal, but I had nothing in savings. And so if I had more listened to my mom back then, I ne probably would never have been in the industry if I had six months to a year to sit in liquid. Well, thank goodness you didn't listen to your mom then, right? I mean, I was going to say that was bad, but maybe it was a good thing. I don't know. I want to switch exactly. gears really quick. I know things happen for a reason, guys. Okay. If you disobeyed your mom, it might play out good later for you. I don't know. Uh, okay. I want to switch gears. I want to talk about Bankosaurus. Am I saying that right? Yeah, Bankosaurus. Bankosaurus. Okay. Tell the listeners about Bankosaurus. He developed this and how long has Bankosaurus been around? And then tell us what it is exactly. I don't, I don't know when I created, I mean, he actually has the cool service mark, the R and everything. And uh, it was just me having fun, just kidifying things. I mean, it doesn't have to be intimidating. And if you can make whatever you do, if you make it fun, it's way easier to go do. If you make training, working out fun, you're going to go do it. If you can make finances fun where it's appealing to you, we will, I mean, we're like electricity is like path of least resistance. I mean, humans were very adaptable creatures. That's a great blessing. It's what makes us humane and distinguishes us from the animals. And at the same time though, it also can be a trap because we can easily adapt, right? And so either way, it could be a good thing. And so the bank of Soros, um, I'm looking at him on my wall right now in my office in the studio. And he was just my way of having fun talking about a unique strategy of just using dividend paying whole life insurance as a very powerful savings strategy. Now, I think too many people in the industry have perverted life insurance, unfortunately. Uh, but if used in synergy with everything else you're doing, whole life can be very, very powerful product for the right people. And uh, But you go tell people, oh, you should get a whole life policy. It's just boring. It's a horrible name. And so I have the whole theme. I've got Joey the T-Rex, which I did an episode about where he came from which is just a stuffed animal gift from my parents because they were gone a lot uh, from Toronto, Canada. And so he was like me, just naturally to myself, kind of shy kid when I was little, uh, Joey the T-Rex, he was my awesome stuff. He, everywhere I went, he was my best friend and my protector. And then the Bankosaurus was like, how do I, just having the whole dinosaur theme, right? Having fun. And my right. kids and parents light up when they get their Bankosaurus t-shirts and they get their Joey uh, gifts. And you know, like the, like the hat I'm wearing right now, that's Joey the T-Rex. Yeah, if you guys can see it, he's wearing the hat with the dinosaur. If you're, if you're listening, it is quite attractive, uh, the logo. Yeah. So I, I think it's worth checking out. You know, it makes finances fun. So it sounds like Bankasaurus is really a way to be able to create your own bank, essentially. Have fun, right? Uh, create passive streams of income through dividend-paying Whole life insurance. Yeah, paying whole life insurance. And I, I predominantly just work with uh, mutual carriers. I think there's an advantage to it long term uh, for clients. And so it was something that was very fascinating to me. I 
Uh, I'm, the only reason why I'm in the industry today is because uh, of a book from a person I admire, a mentor that was in his back shelf, and it was "Become Your Own Banker" by Nelson Ash. And I was like, then I, I was like, man, I've seen that somewhere before. And I, he gave me the book. I couldn't put it down. His whole story to that, and I was like, gosh, man, I gotta. So I, Nelson Nash, other people mentored me. I met him numerous times, and I was like, studied it for nine, ten months. I mean, this is, and I, and I'm talking about study. I really studied it. And You're an engineer. You deep an engineer. dived deep that dive. book. That's what I was doing at <laughs> night, Saturday mornings. That was my fun. Put tabs in there. Yep. Yeah, you get this hyper focus. And I was like, this is just phenomenal. Now, not as an investment, but as a saving strategy. I was like, gosh, if you do this right, I mean, you can get and you structure things right. Uh, I mean, you're getting about at least eight simultaneous benefits with the use of $1. And I was like, this is just awesome. And my first client was me. I applied it to me, applied it to family. Then I started seeing select clients at night because I was engineering full-time again too. Uh, I was just, I just got to teach this to the world. And so that's the Bankosaurus. Just, he's just your big, huge dinosaur. He kind of looks like a brontosaurus and he just, he, he uh, protects your money. It grows, it grows income tax-free, uh, powerful legacy planning with income tax-free death benefit. And you say life insurance, people think you're crazy. Uh, but when you walk through it and you really do a deep dive and boy, do I spend a lot of time educating uh, my clients on it. Uh, and if it's the right fit, it can be a very, very powerful tool as a saving strategy that uh, will enhance every other investment you're doing. And so that's what the bank of source is. And it's not specific to a product, but uh, usually it's tied to it. It's the philosophy and, and how it, it ties into it. And so that's the bank of source. Well, and you know, whole life insurance isn't necessarily a product that a lot of people think of as a go-to when you say investing, creating passive streams of income, planning for your future, but knowing that that is such a good opportunity to be able to generate income for yourself, uh, you're taking you know moderate to low risk. So it's a great product to be able to kind of put in the, the tool belt, right? Because if we put all our eggs in one basket, if you're only doing your 401k or you're only doing, you know, after tax brokerage account, you, there, you need to diversify your portfolio in order to meet your needs at different stages in life. And so a whole life insurance policy that pays dividends and creates income for you is a great way to diversify and put another tool in your tool belt. So uh, for the listeners, that's something that definitely to research and to, I will link in the show notes, as I mentioned before, but I just want to reiterate your website. So that way they can go. And with you being so focused on education for them to learn more about what that product is exactly and how they could implement it into their finances. So I have another question for you before we end, because I know we're coming up on time. What was the top advice that you got that was the best advice you had ever received for your finances? And what's the worst piece of advice that you've ever received? Uh, just throughout my, since I've been in this industry or my, my whole life. Or your whole life. <laughs> the best uh, advice I've got, uh, can you repeat the question one more time? Then just so I got it right. And then I'll answer it. Yeah. The yeah. best piece of advice you have ever gotten. And then the worst piece of advice you have ever gotten oh. when it comes to your finances. Oh, I would say <laughs> they have a place for it, but I would say the worst advice I'll start there is a qu uh, quite often qualified plans. I can't tell you how many people in the, uh, in the investment and uh, in, in financial advisory world, first place they go to for clients are these uh, qualified plans, 401ks, IRAs, um, where uh, essentially your money's tied up until you're 59 and a half. Uh, to me, that's crazy. Um, now they have their place, but it's usually the last place I go to from, from most clients, um, but they can be a powerful tool. But I, I did a blog on it on my website, engineerfinance.com. Uh, it was like a few years ago where I kind of joke, it's a marriage in hell between the financial industry and the IRS, all right? They, they create all the controls and <laughs> you own it, but do you really control it? And so right. it can be very problematic. And you want to talk about delayed gratification, you can't touch that money forever. And, um, and it has its place. So I'm not saying so. But I would say that's probably one of the worst advice. That's what my advisor is going to is, oh, put all your money here. Didn't address everything else. So that's great. So what did he do? He enjoyed the commission. He enjoyed the assets under management fees. He's going to Hawaii, enjoying it with his wife every year. And, and I got to wait till I'm uh, 60. That's a great strategy. To put everything there. Was, so. That was great. Yeah. And it does, and it does have its place down the road. Right. So, but then looking at your, your situation holistically, you know, what makes the most sense for you and your taxes and your income tax bracket and, 
you know, it may not be the best option. So that's interesting. That that's the worst piece of advice was, you've ever that. received. Yes, worst piece of advice. And I ran with it, right? Because he just knew so much when I was 22. And I ran with it, even though in my gut, it made no sense to me, but I did it. And so that was and my point is that he didn't understand everything else. It's just that was like the natural knee jerk response. A lot of advisors go to first. And I don't think that's necessarily the, the, the best place to start for most families and to understand their situation. I would say the best advice, and it's as simple as this, and this is, it's uh, liquidity. This is the first area I'll go for a lot of families is, is, is just have, when I talk about liquidity, when I talk about savings and how I distinguish it between savings and investments, savings, it's safe and it's liquid. You can access it within two weeks, right? And just when you have six months to a year just sitting, it's very hard. It seems like, especially with the guy clients I work with, especially if they're single, the idea of making zero, and I trust me, that was me. Yeah, making zero percent interest is like blasphemy, right? Oh my gosh, when I have all that money making zero percent, no way. That's the dumbest idea ever. But the reality is, when you have that kind of money sitting liquid and you can access it, whether it's just under a mattress in your safe, in a savings or a checking account, in your bank of Soros with a whole bunch of cash value, where you've got control, you got liquidity, you've got use. You got equity, you can get at that money within, I mean, seconds with our smartphones, right? With the banks or within a, a week or so. Uh, that kind of liquidity that's safe, boy, does that create a lot of options. Uh, say you lose your job like I did. You lose your six-figure income. You can't pay your mortgage bill. Well, if you got, you know, uh, six months to a, a year's worth of your expenses sitting liquid in a boring savings account, making nothing in interest, you can pay that mortgage a long, long time. Yeah, it, it definitely has its place. Like you said, you don't want to say everything goes in your 401k, the extremes, right? Everything goes in my brokerage account. You have to make sure, again, diversifying your assets, making sure you're covered for, you know, short-term, mid-term emergency needs. Like you said, post reset, that would have been really nice if instead of throwing everything into the 401k that you had some liquidity available to you, you know? So I think it's really making sure to take into account short-term, mid-term, long-term goals. When will those streams of income be available to you? How can you tap into it and what fits you best? So it's important to not be extreme, right? One way or the other. Well, what's really powerful about liquidity and, and I see it happen over and over again. I've seen it apply to myself, to my family, to the clients I represent, listeners on my show. When this, the fun part of liquidity is when you have a whole bunch of money sitting idle, ready to deploy, you don't even have to look for the opportunities. They will seek you out. Phenomenal investments. This is your permission slip to start chasing rates for a turn. Is, uh, but phenomenal opportunities will seek you out. It's amazing. And I remember working with a, um, a client just a couple of months ago. He used to play a, you know, a little bit, a short stint, NFL, uh, CFL, just a great guy. We were working on a strategy with he and his wife. And I said, we do this type of money move, which doesn't pay my company anything, but was in their best interest. And we change this money so it becomes liquid. Watch what opportunities are going to seek you out next few years. Literally like a week later, he's shooting me emails. Oh, I can't believe it, man. This one it literally just presented itself. And so that's kind of the fun part of money just doing nothing is opportunities will seek you out. And if you watch how Warren Buffett has behaved, which I would argue is one of the best investors yeah. you know, in, in our history, and, and now what he tells us to do what he does is a little bit different. He doesn't just buy stocks and hang on to them. No, he buys companies and hangs on to them forever. And, and he, literally a year ago, he's sitting on a bunch of money, sitting cash, just waiting for the next opportunity to present itself, you know, him, Berkshire Hathaway. And so there's a lot of power just having money making zero. And the opportunities yeah. will seek you out. You don't have to pick up the phone and look for it, right? It'll find you. So that would be the, the, the best advice and the worst advice. I love it. What an interesting perspective. And it really gives food for thought for the listeners. And I'm so glad that I brought you on because again, I think it's so important for our listeners to get as much information as possible, get as many perspectives as possible, because who knows what's going to resonate with each person. And so I love that you have a outside of the box thinking and perspective and approach. And so I mentioned your website earlier, but will you reiterate where the listeners can find you? Oh yeah, best way to find me. I mean, two venues, right? I have Green Fi with an E. It's G R E E N E F I dot com, which you can tell I'm a marketing idiot because half the nation forgets the E. 
So, uh, but then also another way to find me is just engineerofinance.com. Perfect. And, uh, Engineer of Finance Talk and, and my show, the Engineer of Finance Podcast. It's a fun show. It's something that I started because I was absolutely terrified a few years ago. I was like, what scares me the most? And while getting behind a microphone, I was like, well, let's- Oh, I better do it. Yeah, let's get really <laughs> big on this one. Let's make it a podcast. Better do that. Yeah, make it my full-time passion. Well, thank you so much, Ken, for coming on. And as always, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. And if you're not already, make sure you're following us on Instagram is at Financially Free Journey. Make sure that you go and check out Ken's website. It's green with an E, dot. And of course, I will link everything that we've talked about today in the show notes for you. And I will see you all next time.